Hi, I'm Mary Pohl, your host for the Sales Mastery Summit. How do you assume the power position in a really important meeting, especially when you really need to win that business? Today's expert does it through a unique approach called frame control. With me today is Oren Claff, author of Pitch Anything. Welcome, Oren. Thank you. All right. You have a lot of interesting concepts to share, and they all seem to start with attitude. So can you share with us how you developed the methods for Pitch Anything and what kind of role attitude plays? Right. So I think uh, that's great. You know, a lot of people see me and I have a very um, outgoing attitude. All right. Because I've done this a lot and I've learned I work with investors and you do have to bring a certain strength to it. Right. And I think there can be some misinterpretation that attitude in the way that I deliver it is useful. All right. Uh, but I think the structure is more important to me and the structure can be delivered without any attitude or much tone at all. So there's the, the outward attitude, you know, what you're projecting. So a lot of times I'll talk to people about this material and they'll say, yeah, but I can't go in with such a, with such a um, strong forward face. I mean, these are my customers, my buyers, right? Um, I don't want to be so strong with them. I only do it in a very strong way so you can see the structure. But all this stuff can be said very calmly and quietly. So when you structure a social interaction properly, you don't have to be aggressive with it. Now, I think the second thing you're meaning uh, is the internal attitude of I'm the prize. Okay. So I just want to differentiate those two because you'll see me do this stuff very, very, um, you know, with a lot of gusto and, and attitude and intent. Okay. And commitment. But it doesn't have to be done. If you do the structure right, it doesn't have to be done in such a loud tone. Well, and that's what I appreciate in to provide contents, context for our viewers. The reason I'm so excited to bring Oren's content to you is because he sells in the most extreme conditions. And he's come up with a method to win. Essentially, he has to one call close $10 million deals, and he's got at best 90 minutes to do it with a group he's never met before. So if he's figured out methods that work in that situation, and you've got a lot more latitude in your own selling situation, certainly you can knock it out of the park. So um, I appreciate that, um, you know, getting setting the context of attitude in the situation you deal with, you're dealing with some of the biggest, most powerful egos on the planet. And um, so there's some spectrum of that that our viewers will deal with. Let me, yes, um, let me just set the context again, you know, because the way you're hearing it for me, because I walk in a room, as you said, right, with guys who are, you know, command 100 or $200 million, sometimes it's billionaires, right? And they're used to being supplicated to, they're used to having yes men all around them, right? And they're used to getting their way immediately. And I have to get control over that. They're not friendly. They never have a lot of time. And there's very little small talk. So I got to walk in a room, people I've never met before, and pitch them a deal sometimes in 20 minutes or less, okay, when they might see five or 10 deals um, in the same day. It was certainly the same week. So it's very, and if I can't get them wanting what I have very quickly, there's no callback. They never say, hey, we're interested, come back next month. It's not sales, it's pitching. They never come back around and go, hey, um, come back in a week or a month, we'll take another look at it. It's yes or no in that 20 minutes. Very high stakes. The other thing, it can cost you know, twenty or $30,000 to go to some of these meetings. You know, you're bringing some crew, it's maybe across the country. Uh, you've got some preparation time. So it's very, uh, the, the consequences are high doing poorly and that's why I developed this method to um, uh, include you know raise the close to pitch ratio okay I mean that's what ad agencies want that's what salespeople want what's my pitch to close ratio and how do I raise it in my business you know the pitch to close ratios aren't kind of like well for every 20 sales calls we make we well, we close 12, or we close 8, or we close 10. Mine can be, for every three we make, we close zero, right? So it's a very small amount, and you, your, your um, failure has very high consequences. That's why we had to develop something very specific um, in terms of going into those, those high-stakes environments. 
So you've got a process that you, I referred to earlier as frame control. What do you mean by frames? Okay. So I think we're, um, a lot of us are familiar with this uh, kind of um, what Republicans do, you know, frame the issues, right? So friendly fire is framing, right? Or if we say, um, you know, pro-life, right, is framing. Um, so, so the government does framing really well, so we're familiar with framing issues. Frames is a um, continuation of that thought. So in my world, when two people come together, they each bring with them a frame. Okay? And that frame is their attitude and their perspective and what they um, think the deal is worth, how they're going to sell it, where their pricing is at, uh, how much they want to sell. And it's uh, the combination of your point of view, your perspective, your personality, how committed you are. Right? That's your frame, and you bring it to a social interaction. It's the lens through which you see the world. And the other person comes to a meeting with you with their frame. And their frame may be, we want it cheap, we want it fast, right? and we don't care if you lose or make money, we just want it at the price we want it. And your frame may be, we only want customers who will let us make money. I want it to be fun, and I want it to be easy. Right? And these frames come together in a meeting, which is a social interaction, and boom, they collide, right? They collide and they smash because it's incompatible. We want it cheap and we want it fast. We don't care if you make money. And we want to make good profits and have good customers, and we're not going to sell it cheap. Those are incompatible frames. So frames, I'm using um, very uh, high contrast ones, but frames come together in a social interaction and they especially in business interactions, they collide. And the stronger frame breaks the weaker one and it absorbs it. And you see this all the time, right? People come together in meetings and the person who's more committed to their point of view, who has the stronger frame, who owns the room, who gets people reacting to them, eventually absorbs the weaker frame, right? And so uh, I'll give you a quick example of how that might happen. I might come to a meeting and say, I only want to pay $5 per widget, but I know I need them this week. The guy selling me the widgets, his frame is, they're $7, no matter what. Okay, For $6.99, I won't sell it. I'll just walk. I can't break that frame. All right. So these frames either got to bounce off of each other and, and leave, or one has to break the other one and absorb it. All right. So your frame is your um, the information you have about your deal, how committed you are to it, your personality. It's your view of the whole interaction. Frames come together, they smash into each other. The stronger frame breaks the weaker one and absorbs it. That's what I mean by frames. And then obviously falling out of that is frame control, right? So frame control is when you understand how frames work together, right, and you make it not so combusted. Your frame comes in, it dents the frame of the other, the other frame, and it, it does, you know, um, uh, take over and it absorbs it. So you get frame control without a monster frame collision. So that's my view on framing. So it would seem um, that naturally the customer would own the power position because they have control whether they're going to write the check or not, and I want the deal, so I either walk out with nothing or I let them maintain the power. So how do I get myself in that power position? Yeah. So you call a power position, right? And we have a name for it, and I don't, don't think it's that different, but you know, in my methodology, I call it the prize frame. So when you walk into a room, with a buyer. Okay? The buyer and you view the money or the purchase order as the prize to be won. Right? So you walk in the room, you say, hey, Mr. Jones, what a beautiful office you have. You know, let me juggle for you a little bit. And why, let me entertain you. Can I get you some coffee? Can I make you comfortable? Is there anything you need? How was your flight? Oh, you flew in from Chicago? Wow, you know, bears this year are looking pretty good. I love your suit. Wow, you have a great smile. Um, uh, you know, we love doing business with you. We've wanted your account for a long time. So those are all things you say to supplicate to the power, okay, to the power frame, 
the, uh, because you're trying to win the prize of their money. Right? You want their order or their money. That's the prize to be won. And you're doing whatever you think is necessary to win the prize. So I bring an alternate point of view to these um, you know, encounters, right? And the view that I have is what I have is the prize. Money, customers are available anywhere. Okay? My product, and let's just say, you know, and I use this as an example, my product is blue plastic frogs. They scare away insects, right? Better than anything else in the world. Right? They're very hard to make. The blue that scares insects is only available in Afghanistan. It's true. You can grow mineral blue in labs, but the real blue that, that is organic only comes from Afghanistan. Hard to get. You can imagine there's a war there, right? So, um, and we have so much engineering in our blue plastic frogs. The demand in France is crazy. We just don't even have enough supply, and I'm choosing my customers. So you, in the time we have together, need to think about how you would be a good customer, and I want to hear from you, why I would take some of my limited supply and let you have it. And by the way, I only want customers that are fun to work with, right? Let me profit, add value to the relationship, okay, and help me grow my business. And so I'll, yes, I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes telling you about the world's greatest blue plastic frogs. But after I'm done, you're going to be telling me why well, you're the world's greatest customer of these, right? Because if you're not a good customer, call me a cab. I'm out of here. We can get customers anywhere. There's only a limited amount. And certainly, uh, there's a limited amount of blue plastic frogs. There's a limited amount of blue. The French want them, right? And, uh, and they're getting more popular in Europe. But independent of all that, even if we had warehouse and warehouse in China full of this stuff, which we don't, there's only one of me, all right? And my time is limited. I can manage about 10 customers, and then that's it. The 11th customer I have to say no to. And right now I have eight. So I'm interviewing number nine and number 10, all right? And if you don't pass the interview, you can go kick rocks. You can go buy yellow plastic rocks, all right? They suck at scaring off insects. So that's the discussion we're going to have here today, right? And so, you know, again, I say this uh, in, a, in a loud tone of voice, but it's the structure that's important. So now, and hopefully you've got a sense of it there, that is the way that we move the concept of uh, who has the power frame. The prize is me and my product. I'm the only one that has it. I'm the, you know, I have a limited capacity to deal with people. And there's certain rules that I require my customers to play in. And those are good business rules, right? Having fun, being profitable, adding value. It's not me supplicating to you. If anything, right? If anything, you're going to um, uh, try and impress me during this meeting. I'll allow you to be my customer. And I think you um, distinguish something really important that our goal in business is to be respected first. And as you set up the typical scenario, it's all about being liked. I want to be liked. And in that process, you really come off as, am I worthy enough for you to like me right. and sounding needy when really to do, you know, do you want to be their golfing buddy or do you want to be their business partner? Great if you can be both, but the goal is to be a business partner. So, you know, it's really about establishing, I think, that mutual respect is what you set up and not, you know, I, I desperately need you to like me. So I think, and, and uh, just hearing you, it occurs to me, and this is something I hadn't thought of before, but there's two paths to do that, right? And one is you see what most people do, is they walk in a room and they try and get some orientation. Oh, you like the Bears? Oh, you know, we lived in Chicago for a while, we like the Bears. What happened to Grossman? I can't believe his arm melted down. Yeah, I'm really hopeful this year. I'm looking forward to that game with New Orleans. Oh, you went to that game? Oh, you know, um, uh, my dad taught at the University of Illinois. Oh, you went there? I mean, you look for these, like, points of geographic and psychographic interest, right? And that is how most people think, or the books have said, with all due respect to Tony Robbins, you know, going for rapport, very difficult. And maybe he's the best in the world, I don't know, but... I don't know anybody who's read that stuff and can actually do it. Rapport is, uh, it's like height. You can't teach height. People are good at rapport, right? And they try and teach it to other people and they can't do it. Forget rapport, all right? I think a much stronger tool to get that self-respect, and, and really instead of rapport, what I want is status, right? And I think anybody, if you walk in a room and say, 
I'm busy. Got another meeting to go to. Glad I could find time for us to get together. Good to hear all these, uh, you know, you're doing well. All right. I've got about a 20 minute presentation. Why don't you hold off on telling me about your stuff? Let me give you the presentation. And then in context of what I have, you can tell me more about yourselves. All right. Boom. That does like 27 different things for status. One, time constraint. Two, yeah, yeah, you know, I know you're the customer and everybody else listens to you wax you know, theoretical about your stuff and your great accomplishments, but I don't have time for that, right? We're doing business. We're busy, all right? I know how to control time. I know how to set an agenda. I know how to get frame control. I know how to prize. I understand the value of money, that it's a commodity. I mean, so many things there move you up the status chain. And I don't talk a lot, a lot about this in interviews, um, but I think this is good for your, you, know, you and your audience, right? This is something you should look into. You cannot sell from low status. I don't care how good your product is. I don't care how good your pitch is. I don't care how good looking you are, right? Um, how well proofed you are going in there. If you have low social status, low status at all, you can't bridge the gap. They do many, many experiments on this. Like they, um, they uh, give the experimenters cell phones to sell with different plans, and make the other group the buyers, right? And if they if they set it up so the seller is low status, it doesn't matter how good the plan is. To be basically free on a free smartphone with kickbacks. The buyer, if they perceive this huge status imbalance, won't buy. If there's if there's um, the status imbalance another way, the seller has high status, the buyer will buy almost anything, even at a disadvantage. So they study this over and over again. You gotta get status. You don't need rapport, right? Rapport is good, it's too friggin' hard to manage. Show me somebody who knows how to get it. That's not a natural. I'm waiting to see that. All right? But get rapport, get status. Well, in an initial meeting, nobody's got extra time these days. So if you can establish your value and status right up front, there's time to be likable and build rapport later if you've got it. But if you start there, when are you ever, you know, no wonder selling cycles are dragging out so much longer. Um, you got to kind of cut to the chase. And let me say one more thing about rapport. It's good. Make them build it with you. Why the hell should you make the effort? Raise your status. Okay. I want to give you a little example. I know you've heard this before. After I give a pitch, the way I do it with the method that I have, you know, develop, delivering the big idea, the problem, uh, the solution, how it works, doing it all in 20 minutes, the economics, the upside, the downside, the timeline, you know, the, the uh, um, really focusing on, on making it fun and interesting and intriguing and doing it with nine, in 19 and a half minutes. People are like, what? That is amazing. And then what will happen is they will feel like, they need to raise their status to my level, but they don't have the tools to do it. And they start doing weird things. They start trying to get rapport with me. And I've said it before, they'll knock over their coffee as they're trying to tell some weird story to try and um, um, get on par with the way I've done it, the things I've talked about, and the intrigue that I've built. Really, you know, the, um, the narrative structure to the pitch has been so beautiful. They acknowledge it. And they try and want to bring their status up to where mine is, and they don't have the tools to do it, right? And then you really feel the buyer supplicating to you. One of the greatest feelings in the world. You walk in a room to sell something, and people are trying to impress you. So status is really important. And if you want to go for rapport, let the rapport happen from their side. Make them work to get rapport from you. So, Oren, in that situation, in you know, again, back to the extreme situations that you're pitching in, how do you keep people, especially when there's $10 million riding on a deal, how do you keep them from going into paralysis of analysis and, you know, keep them engaged in, you know, your topic and not need to push off to, you know, we need to investigate, we need to analyze? So, so I'm not sure of the um, sophistication, you know, of your audience, but I know you're very sophisticated. So if it's a reflection of you, Mary, then I think this will make sense. This is not something I would kind of talk about 
to your average Joe, you know, selling Joe bag of donuts, selling, um, uh, you know, tires at a big O tires. This is you know, for kind of bag carrying, sophisticated salespeople. There, every sale has a process, okay? Uh, and the process is, hey, good to meet you. We have a value proposition. You have a need. Let's talk about if our value proposition, we have ball bearings, right, that um, are less expensive and last longer. You manufacture engines, okay? Let's get together and see if it's a fit. Get together, some exchange of information. There's a... Um, See if there's chemistry, right? Talk about applications, right? So that's really, you know, the phase one. Then, you know, phase two is what would a deal look like? Do the specifications fit? Then there's due diligence, right? On real specification matching. Maybe engineers get together. Then there is uh, you know, deep due diligence, financial due diligence, contracts, contract signing, money changing hands. It's a roughly approximate business you know, sales process. Some people are faster. If you're selling a car, that all happens in one day. If you're selling, uh, you know, Boeing jets, that might happen in five years. But that's roughly the process. When people try to get out of phase with process, all right, that's what you're talking about. Deep analytics, really due diligence before there's, for example, a chemistry match. Well, why the, why would I show you and why would we get into specifications on RPM spins, on ball bearings, and the substance of Teflon coating when I don't even know if we like each other? It doesn't matter. I don't even know if we have the chemistry. I don't even know. We haven't even talked about what a, um, if your capacity needs meet our manufacturing capability. Why would we, we do deep due diligence and analytics on this other stuff? All right? So what, ha what you're talking about is when the sale gets out of phase with a normal process. What I'll do, I'm not recommending you do it, is say step off, you're out of phase, right? The phase that we're at is figuring out if we like each other and you want to look at engineering specs. And that signals to me, you're a, you know, someone I might not want to work with. It doesn't make sense. And so I'll give you a more uh, specific tool that is less combative, okay? So if somebody says, um, many times I've been in a room, we've been introducing the product in phase with where the relationship should be. Our company manufactures a genetic test. And unlike, uh, unlike tests that cost uh, you know, $4,000 for a single trait test, our test is $350 for 1,000 different genetic traits and conditions. Great value proposition. But then we'll have an analyst pop up and say, I need to know what equipment you do your sequencing with. Okay? I need to know what, what genetic equipment you do your sequencing with because I'm not sure your cycle times match with what I have seen with similar equipment. Okay? So what will happen is the CEO or the vice president of engineering will now chase that conversation thread because they feel like they have to prove themselves. You know, but I say, stop. You don't have to answer that. Listen to me. Right here. The specifications are in the binder. All right? And you and the engineers can go knock yourselves out all night to go through specifications. We have 10 executives in this room, some of which have flown 3,000 miles to see if there's a business deal in the mix here. Rather than waste everyone's time validating the um, knowable, okay? Rather than waste every time, everybody's time going through engineering specs, we would not be here with equipment that didn't work. We wouldn't have some of the largest customers in the industry if our machines didn't spin at that cycle. That's something that you're going to do in due diligence. And you know what? If you want to blow out in due diligence, blow the hell out. That's fine. There's nothing we can do about that. The specs work. They are what we say they are. If you need to come around and say you don't believe in the specs, do that in due diligence. We don't even know what a deal looks like. So let's spend the time we have together with executives, okay, focusing on relationship, chemistry, general terms, what it might look like, 
and and um, figuring out if we have the right character to work together. Now, to answer your question specifically, does the uh, sequencing equipment spin at um, you know 19 million light cycles per milliamp second? Yes, and it's in the book. And at the appropriate time, we'll have you look through it. All right. So that is a lot going on there, right? But again, for your guys, the um, The analytical questions you put back and say, hey, Lauren, can you move your notebook again? It must be covering your mic. Oh, really? that sounded great. Once yeah. you pick that up. Thank you. There we go. So the um, the analytical questions when they when you feel internally that they are um, uh, you'll know when the analytical questions feel like they're derailing mm -hmm. your sales process. Right. Why is that? It's because they're out of they're good questions. They're just out of phase with the process. And you say to someone, hold on, Tiger, we're going to get to that. Well, I don't know if I like you yet. And if I don't like you, I'm not going to sell you this stuff. Yeah. And then that question is immaterial. What, um, what I think is so important about this is I would think most companies have their sales process, spin selling or whatever they use that's set up for you know, the phases the sales rep goes through with a customer and they'd be so excited to skip a phase, you know, and get closer to the closing the deal. But by you kind of setting up gates essentially or expectations for the customer at each phase, you stay in sync. Like you said, you don't waste time on deals that are never going to close because if they didn't get through an initial gate, don't waste your time going forward. And that's a big issue for people. And I would think that it solidifies the, um, buyer's commitment a lot more to have gone through each step so, and they don't end up with remorse in the end. Yeah. So I have a different view on it, but it's really the same result. Okay. So when I pitch a deal and at the end of the pitch, somebody goes, I'm done. I'm ready to buy. Right. Where do I send the check? I go slow down tiger. Right. You might be a buyer, but I'm not a seller. I don't know anything about you. Why is that? Because there, you know, there's a process and to the degree you run to the end, and skip. For me, it's a social process. If you run to the end and skip social phases, you're going to get retraded, right? Somebody can say he's a buyer, mm -hmm. right? I'm ready. But if you um, um, advance too quickly without locking down certain, um, um, you know, relationship and frame control elements, right? You don't have a buyer. You have a retrader, and your closing is going to be miserable. All right. Or if they say, I'll wire right now and you go, okay, wire while we're sitting here, the money comes in the account. You go, I just made a sale. You got a miserable potential. He's continuing to retrade post close. Mm -hmm. So I want to introduce this concept of counterparty. Now everybody knows it, right? In the financial markets, it's a little different. You know, you're, if you're selling a copier to someone, we don't consider them, we consider them a, a, a customer or a buyer, right? They buy the copier and a sale is made and you move on to the next thing. In the financial markets, when two, a buyer and seller agree to make a transaction, that can go on for months and it locks up capacity. And so really your buyer is a counterparty. So in the financial market, it's called counterparty risk. So even if you have a buyer, somebody goes, we wanna buy many times or maybe even most times, the seller will say no to a willing buyer. Because we go, we can't take the counterparty risk. All right. So in the same way, if you sell a copier to a, you know, small manufacturing company in your town, it, there's still a counterparty, right? They can, sure, they can pay for it, but they can make your life miserable. They can break it every day. They can mistreat the equipment. They cannot service it properly. They can tell other people that you suck. Buy your product and tell other people you suck. As counterparty risk. All right. They cannot pay their bill. And then your sales manager, your CEO goes, you sell customers that blow. I don't like you anymore. Okay. You, you, you're on the status totem pole. You're going down. Your customers don't stick. So it's not a customer in a check. It's counterparty risk. On one sense, that's interesting from building your business, but I'm not, as, I'm not as worried about you building your business. What I care about is in the moment is you could say, hey, I got to find out if you're a good counterparty because if you buy from me, I take your money, 
I take on counterparty risk. Let's talk about that. All right. So I know it seems opposite from what spin selling or these guys will tell you. Once you have a willing buyer, it says, I'll write you a check. Stop talking. Right. You hear that all the time. If you do that and you abandon your process, you're going to get retraded. Okay. I mean, and, and there's exceptions to every rule. So I have people call up and say, I have a buyer and I stopped talking. Okay. So once or twice that worked, but on balance, on balance, you need to take people all the way through your process and they need to understand that they offer you counterparty risk. You're not willing to take their money. You're the prize. You have the product, right? There's lots of people who want it. You're busy. If you're a good salesperson, you add tons of value. If you want the value that I bring to a sale, you pay for it, all right? And you pay for it in this way. You pay the real price, okay? You, um, you're fun to work with. You're easy to work with, all right? And you follow good process. That's how you pay in addition to money. And so, um, it, and one thing I want to add is, you know, this has to have a social layer. You can't be yelling. I mean, I do yell at the customers or buyers, but it has to be fun. Like if you say to someone, you know, you have enormous counterparty risk and I'm not sure I can take your money, right? And you don't know them that well. I mean, that should be said with a smile, not with, you know, a bitterness. So okay. it can go wrong. But it's very fun to say to someone, you know, John, I really appreciate you want to buy, but as you know, this is my meeting. We're on my agenda, right? You gave me an hour and this is my hour and you were going to follow what I do. And unfortunately, I know you want to buy now, but you have to buy when I say so, right? And that's fun, okay? Because they've never heard that before, yeah. all right? But if you say it bitter or cruel or with the wrong kind of um, social uh, structure, you know, then it can go kind of weird. But the bottom line, it's important to recognize that um, if you're, if you can't view yourself as the prize, the easy way to do that and how we got in this conversation is recognizing what counterparty risk the, the buyer gives you, all right? They can make you look bad. You know, well, or, and like you said, you're screening them as well as they're, they're screening you. And if you're dealing with bad high maintenance customers, it's because you let them in the door. So don't skip your screening process. So we, yeah. And, and um, I want to share where this came from because uh, mainly I sell investors. So if I have a deal and let's say I have 10 investors in it, right? And I introduce you as the 11th investor. Many decisions among investors have to be made unanimously. When to sell, at what price, okay? When to allow uh, to raise more money, when to change management. So if I have 10 investors here and I introduce you as the 11th, and you're difficult, right? Um, it causes um, a tremendous pain to the other investors. So I have to screen you very carefully. I have to make sure I don't introduce a bad apple or a bad actor to this decision-making group. So we cannot just take, maybe we have a harder business than everyone else. Because when people want to buy, we have to really, really understand the nature of that buyer before we can take their money because we're introducing them into a very unique and small ecosystem where they have to be a good player, a good actor. And so we learned to push back on people. And then the, um, if you want to tie this into something actionable, this is a good way to think about it, right? People want what they cannot have. People chase that which moves away from them. And people don't value something unless they pay for it. So if you're wondering if prizing works for you, right? Think about it in terms of counterparty risk, but also think about it that people don't value things that they get for free. So if you're supplicating, you're lowering price, you're not negotiating hard, you're abandoning your process and you're doing things to supplicate to the customer, right? They don't value that. It and they lose respect. Yeah. So the things you do that you think strengthen your position, give a discount, are considered to be weak and needy, right? So not only is this a good idea, you have to do it because of the reciprocal, the, the, um, the other side of it is that um, by not prizing, you look needy. And there's all kinds of social biology things that happen when you look needy, right? Um, and I know you didn't ask this, but maybe I'll just kind of um, uh, talk about this for a second. We basically think about all these situations with a brain that is 
adapted to 200,000 year old situations, right? Find something to eat, find something to mate with, and find something to warm to sleep at night. That's it. That's what we care about, right? So when you act needy, in the social biology of the ancient brain, it feels like you're going to take resources from me, mm. right? And we, um, we feel our resource, when somebody wants our resources, when somebody's needy, we get scared, generates fear, okay? Because uh, for most of human time, resources were very, very constrained. There was very little food, very little shelter, very few mates, okay? And so when anybody comes up and they acted needy, we immediately try to kill them or run away from them or, or isolate ourselves from them because resources were so constrained. And any kind of neediness triggers that, that same reaction. And you know, because when you walk by a restaurant, okay, and there's somebody standing outside of it and you're passing on the street and they say, hey, come on in. And there's nobody sitting in there and it's not busy. It feels needy and you're scared. Why is that? Have you ever thought about it? I mean, you know, hey, they're not busy. People don't like them. You're scared. When people want something from you, it scares you. And that's, a, that's an ancient reaction to resource constraint, right? And so when you act needy, you scare people. So the flip side is being the prize. And you must have some magic way to set yourself up as the prize in a meeting um, because we've also made the promise that you can make people want what you have before you've really even gotten into what it is. So how could you do that? How can you build the value as you, you are the prize? So um, I think the basic tools are frame control. Okay, so within frame control, you know, this is many hours of kind of discussion. But I, by the way, we have those, you know, the videos that really go into prize. I mean, I think there's a, a 45 minute long video on prizing at the, um, at the URL. I'm not even sure what it is. Uh, pitchanything.com slash video. Okay. All right. There's almost an a, you know, hour, hour and a half of material specifically on prizing and frame control. But I'll give you a quick primer on it, right? So one is you've got to go in, you've got to get control of um, your status, all right? You do that with prizing, right? Time constraint, so a time frame, all right? Um, the um, defiance or denial, okay? So if somebody says, let me tell you about our company, our firm. You, you deny them that opportunity. You say, why don't you hold off on that? And I'll tell you about the product. Then you can reflect back on your firm as it relates to the product. Okay. So that's a, you know, um, that's a very useful way to get frame control, right? Is a, a, uh, denial. Okay. Um, I think about it, talk about in the book, sometimes we'll put some collateral material out, you know, secret submarine plans, you know, not really, but when they reach for it, the collateral, you know, we knock their hand away and say, stop. All right, and that will show you this when we're ready. It's our agenda, right? That's the denial. And it's a very strong way if it's done, you know, socially to get frame control. So all these things raise your status, prize you, get frame control and position you to have attention. Right? Maybe this is the last point I can leave you with today. And the way to get wanting, right, is to raise your status and do all these things. but Obey the limits of human attention spans. 20 minutes. 20 minutes is about what you get. Okay? If you go beyond the 20 minute mark in your pitch, you know, your real like presentation or your sales cycle or everything like that, you, um, people not only start for, you know, they don't remember what you are telling them after the 20 minute mark, they start forgetting the stuff that you told before the end of the 20 minute. I mean, there really is a limit of human attention. We have some good experiments so you can feel that in your own mind. Um, we could do that on a different day. I don't have the material you know, prepared here, but uh, there's a real limit to human attention span. And by obeying it, 
uh, it does a lot to not, um, you, you know, everybody, not everybody, good salespeople know how to create wanting on their own, right? But when they blow out of that human attention span, they kind of undo the good work that they've done, right? So um, creating wanting uh, is, is about providing a narrative, right, that's interesting to listen to, points of intrigue, um, obeying the 20 minutes, setting yourself up as the prize, controlling status, doing that with denials and defiances. And I think that's, you know, that's a lot to go on in this period of time, but, but that will be effective. The, the last thing I want to leave with you for sure is this business, because you have salespeople and, you know, that's your field, is this business of asking questions, right? I can't friggin' stand it. You know, especially when I look at spin selling, it is so exhausting because people do that to me to sell me something. What are your goals? In two years, growing business, where do you want your revenue to be? Um, what are your sticking points right now? What's holding you back, right? Um, what don't you like about your copier right now? Um, if you could print better, you know, what are your printing objectives? What's your budget look like, right? Um, these questions take value. Like, this should be part of a conversation. I really don't feel like giving you all the information that you need to then go ahead and sell me something at a high price. In every single pitch I have, and I've sold hundreds of millions of dollars of stuff, equity, but also products, we ask almost no questions. I'll go through an entire meeting without asking a question other than where's the bathroom? How do I get more coffee? Right? So, well, how can you have an interaction right? Without questions. Will you make statements? Because questions force people into a social interaction with you, right? If I ask you a question, like a bum walks you up on the street, you don't want to talk to him, but he says, hey, do you know where Target is? You know, you, it's very difficult just to what it forces someone and then he'll follow. You're doing the same thing. You're forcing someone to interact with you with a question. You don't know where you are in the social relationship. So what I do is I make statements, right? And the degree someone follows that statement in for a conversation is to the degree you know how much frame control you have, right? So, uh, I mean, I just had one yesterday. I was working with a group. They want us to raise money for them, right? And I was, uh, instead of asking them, you know, if they're you know, ready to commit, you know, I just say something like, I'm, it's not really clear to me where your level of commitment is because I'm seeing some signals that aren't typical in this kind of deal. All right. That's a statement that provides insight. It has some tension. It's novel. It's not, um, Hey guys, if we could make the time to take you on as a client, would you be ready to commit now? Right. It's friggin' annoying. Right. And most people, I think, today are offended by that. I think the world, the selling world has moved on from this, you know, this this gnip gnop of question and answer. We don't ask questions. Questions take value. We try and add value. Right. And so if you want to sell me, I don't know how you're going to tell your, you know, you guys go out there and you spend your whole lives and make millions of dollars without ever meeting me. But if you want to meet me and get our money, you know, we spend millions of dollars a year. And our investor spends hundreds of millions of dollars. You better not come in and ask us, carrying your spin selling field book, and ask me 50 friggin' questions and fill out a questionnaire. Just, so, you know, you better come in ready to have a, a social conversation about what it is we're doing and how we might do something together. Perfect. Makes sense? Makes sense. And I love the controversy that you add there, too. So, um, and, you know, to clarify, you've done the prep work beforehand. So you're walking in with the answers because you prepared yourself. But if you're sitting there wasting somebody else's time asking them questions, you've lost the, the frame control and you're not adding any value. Uh, yeah. And so there's no, mis you know, conception. If you go to sell ball bearings, right, you need to know, right, what their annual order volume is in Teflon coated um, quarter inch ball bearings, right? I mean, that's got to be part of the conversation, but I might do it. I don't sell ball bearings. I might say, you know, we need to do capacity matching on our side. You know, 
we can manufacture 50 to 100 million a year. So maybe this is a good time to start talking about capacity matching. All right. There's no question there. It's a statement. Right? And it also is a chance for you then to get a signal. I mean, if they jump in and want to start providing that, then you didn't force it on them, but you can test their engagement level. That's right. That's right. You know, um, I try, I try not make this stuff too. see when you do it socially, you don't have to make it so technical, right? You don't have to have these little, like, um, uh, I was looking at the challenger sale or somebody handed me that, you know, and there are these negotiation pre there's all these fields to fill out and knowing where you are and what you can, can concede and everything like that. Right. I mean, I think that's useful, but it is terrible in a way because your customer is trying to fall into the analytic mode. How much is it? What are the discounts? How can I get the fastest? You make no money, right? And we get the most. That's what he's thinking. Yeah. Now you start thinking analytically, right? And both you retards are doing analytical thinking and nobody is conducting a, a you know, a, a, a wanting experiment, you know? Um, it's funny, I went, uh, yesterday, we, uh, we had a little downtime. We went and looked at this giant Jeep somebody had built, and we saw it in there. It's really cool, you know, just like a toy. It's like an $80,000 Jeep. So we went there, and we started adding up the parts and everything. We're like, oh, my God, this thing's like, you know, it's like 44-inch tires and bars and lights and everything for off-roading. And uh, so he wants $80,000 for it, right? And uh, we're like, well, we can't really do the math on all the parts and the labor. He goes, no. This is just for somebody who wants it, okay? Now, I know you can't run your business like that, You're just waiting for people to want what you have, but you gotta work on creating wanting. So if you have an analytical sale and they have an analytical sale, then you guys are just trying to do calculus, right? And really people buy not because of that. You didn't choose your wife or you didn't decide where to go to dinner or you didn't buy the car that you have probably, right? Or you don't go on vacation because of calculus. You do it because you want it. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that, right? Tr transactions are much easier when they're emotional than when they're analytical. So why would you feed into the analytical buying system, right? You make it social on your side and fun and try and get the other guy to want what you have, right? And of course, you're going to sell honestly with transparency. They're going to get the numbers. You're not going to overcharge. Maybe, let's see, I know we went over on time. Maybe that's the last thing I'll say is lots of time because we're so good at creating wanting, we can overcharge, okay? But my partner many years ago taught me, don't be a pig. I'm like, but Russ, we can make, you know, another $500,000 on this deal each. It's a lot of dough. He says, that will come back to haunt us. Eventually they'll know that they overpaid. Like, yeah, but I'm so good at creating the wanting. They're willing to pay it, ha ask them. Tell them they're overpaying, they'll go, we don't mind. We want it. He said, we're not pigs. We leave money on the table. We charge a fair price. If we charge more than market, if we charge more than market, we'll come back to haunt us. Okay, we don't need to be pigs. So you can get so good at developing wanting, you can get more than your fair share. That's how good you can get at it. And when you do that, you know, you come back to, you know, almost have to push it back the analytic way a little bit and say, we're gonna be transparent. We're gonna sell this at market. We sell it fair. I'd rather you place a giant order. Why don't we get you started? Why don't we get you started with something that you can, uh, we think you can absorb. So it's, it's, you know, when you create wanting, it's very powerful. Perfect. I love ending on that note too, because that is the most valuable life skill any sales rep could build. Yeah. And uh, so thanks for helping us dig into that today. Okay, good. Good, Mary. It's good talking to you. And uh, I know I did most of the talking this time and next time I'll let you do all the talking. <laughs> Perfect. And thank you to our viewers for tuning in and investing in your own success. The Sales Mastery Summit is here to help you never stop learning from the best. Thank you.